So this is Cal Maloney. He's an anarchist. He's with a group called Liberate RVA. Um, thank you so much for coming out. And <laughs> thank you so much, Joy, for uh, allowing me to come in here and talk about anarchy. Uh, <coughs> it's definitely a new topic, I guess I would imagine, for many people who've heard. I guess anyone's heard of Chomsky? Yeah, a little bit. You gentlemen in back. Uh, so this is a different brand of anarchism. I would say a little bit more consistent with that. And before I talk about like what is anarchy or talk about uh, answer, like we're going to do a Q&A in the end. I usually like to set up with uh, three simple questions and then basically describe what is government and then uh, ask what uh, your thoughts are after that. Cool? All right, so first question would be, um, in your day-to-day -day lives, do you use violence to solve your personal problems? Everyone's looking at each other. Uh, all right, so, 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 let's, so let's define the terms, right? Like before we box, let's agree to the rules, right? So violence will be defined as uh, placing a person in an involuntary position without their choice or consent, right? I rape, murder, theft, and assault, right? All violation of personal property rights, right? I own myself. These will be the initiation of force, right? So would you therefore say, would you consider it wrong and immoral? In your day-to-day -day life, do you use violence then to solve your personal problems? No, no. And the question is not have you ever, right? Um, second question would be, would you, with the exception of self-defense, of yourself and others, would you consider it wrong and immoral to initiate that force? Right? Uh, and that's initiation force, that self-defense is not the initiation of force, right? It's the resistance from those who want to initiate force, of yourself and that of other people, right? And then the last question would be, would you consider it then wrong and immoral to violently force your ideas onto other people? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Versus like what we're doing right now, discussion, <coughs> persuasion, uh, reasoning. Uh, if you didn't like what I had to say, you could ignore me, ostracize me, uh, walk away, right? But if I were to grab you and threaten you, you know, you have to listen to what I say, you have to stay in this room, uh, then I would be violently forcing my ideas onto you, right? Um, all right, so then Jesus told me pretty much, which are a lot of head nods uh, <laughs> and yep and yes, is that uh, you have a plurality of nonviolent solutions that you use to solve your personal problems, right? You have this more integrity against that violence, against the initiation of force, right? And as a community of individual people here, and uh, I guess, what city is this? This is not part of Richmond. Greater Richmond, I guess, uh, Midlothian. Uh, as a community of individual people here in Midlothian, though, we're taught that the only way we can solve any kind of problems or find solutions to our community problems is through politics, through government, through voting, right? We had a midterm election just recently. So people vote. People vote with their ideas, opinions, and preferences, and how best to solve that community problem. And in effect, they like the politician, right? That politician, his or only job is to legislate those ideas and opinions into law. And then those laws of opinions are then backed and enforced by the police at gunpoint. Right, you could take a uh, government opinion that cannabis is bad for everybody, right? Not here advocating anyone to do it, but, you know, that's just uh, the way that the law is written. The government prescribes that it's uh, wrong and immoral for everyone, and, uh, and if you were to do it, you'd be, if I were to smoke a plant, for example, I will be threatened with, uh, I'll be thrown into a cage, right, a prison, uh, in which I will be uh, kidnapped, uh, arrested, in which I have no point of choice to refuse, in which if I wanted to escape because I disagree with that opinion, I'd be made with more violence or sometimes shot, murdered, right? And at the same time, government is even thrown into more violence because at no point can you say, I do want to help the poor, but I don't want to fund war, right? You have no freedom of economic choice. You still have to give me your money. You still have to give up your property. You still have to pay your taxes. Because if you did have a freedom of economic choice, what to do with your own money, how best to allocate your own resources, the government wouldn't threaten to send you to another cage if you didn't pay your taxes, right? Uh, if they can send Wesley Snipes into a cage for three years for not paying his taxes, they can certainly send anyone else, right? Uh, so that's what government is. Objectively, this organization then only knows how to solve problems through one way, a singular way, and that's through the threat of and use of violence to solve any problems versus, though, the plurality of nonviolent solutions that all of us in this room shares, right? So that's what government is. And now we want to break it down even more objectively. Uh, what is government? Government has a monopoly. Like when, we, when I say I'm an anarchist, it doesn't mean like I want to overthrow the government or I don't want uh, police or laws or anything like that. I do want that. I do want laws. I want roads. I want security. I want post office. I want uh, ABC, right? I want alcohol, distilled spirits. But government has a monopoly on these services. So objectively, government has a monopoly on the services you and I want. They have a monopoly on roads. They have a monopoly on uh, security, on law, on judges resolving disputes, on... Um, the post office is a great example. 
The post office has a monopoly on delivering pieces of paper. It is illegal and criminal for FedEx, UPS, and DHL to deliver pieces of paper, first class mail. They can only deliver packages, right? So if you wanted to go into the entrepreneurship role to compete, you're not allowed to. Uh, you'll get fined, you get penalized, and of course, if you don't pay that fine, you get thrown into a cage in prison. Um, so anytime you have a government monopoly on any service, though, the costs go up. You know, when people ask you, how do you feel about the rise in uh, stamp costs, right? It's not like you have a choice, right? It's not like you can go anywhere else, right? Uh, when McDonald's increases the prices, you can go to cookout, right? You go to Burger King. You have choices, right? When government increases the prices, the taxes, you don't have a choice. There's nowhere else to go. They've outlawed competition. So anytime you have a government monopoly, cost goes up and quality depreciates. Uh, for example, you'll be hard pressed to find a clock at your local post office. That is how they solve long wait lines, right? It's very Kafkaesque. Uh, they're not efficient, they're not a business. They can't allocate the resources efficiently. Uh, I mean, you look outside, you look at your post box office, uh, you look at your USPS boxes, you look at your FedEx boxes. They look nice, clean, proficient. They have an incentive, right, to, for the consumer to look, this is a nice box. You look at the USPS one, it's rusting away, there's graffiti on it. Um, there's no real ownership over the post office since it belongs to anyone or everyone, right, publicly owned. There's no incentive to efficiently take care of these things as you would private property. Uh, so that's what the USPS is. And the quality has to depreciate in so much that they're $16 billion in debt. They're threatening to cut us Saturdays. Um, and you can extrapolate that one example of USPS with all the other monopolies the government has. Uh, you can look at uh, like the unfunded liabilities in Detroit that caused it to collapse. Right? It takes over an hour for the police to respond to 911 calls. Right? Uh, there might be sometimes uh, contention and then people believe that government uh, provides protection, for example, right? And, uh, and I, I grew up that way too, right? I thought that the police is here to protect you in that regard. But the uh, Supreme Court has ruled in many cases, and please look this up, this, this is, uh, blew me away when I found this out as well. Um, like in DeShaney uh, versus uh, Winnebago, the Supreme Court has ruled in many Supreme Court cases that the police have no obligation to protect you. They have no constitutional duty or obligation to protect your life, liberty, or property. Only when you're detained, <laughs> right, for cannabis or something. Uh, but other than that, they have no obligation. Now imagine that if I came to your house and asked you, hey, would you like to sign up for this uh, security service protection plan in which I don't have to provide it if I don't feel like it, you know, you, you close the door on me. <laughs> you tell me to get out, you warn your neighbors of the scam, um, and that's what is presented. There's no obligation. You're being forced then to pay for a service and which they don't have to provide, right? Uh, and which, of course, you don't have the freedom to compete to provide that kind of protection. And as so much, you don't have the freedom to compete against USPS and their monopoly or many of the other monopolies that the government has. Some questions that people may have uh, that maybe that government does produce, like the roads, for example, right? <coughs> the government doesn't even build that out also. <laughs> they outsource that to businesses to build the roads. So you can look at the government then in that situation as the middleman, uh, robbing you of your economic freedom to choose, right? To choose among uh, people who, entrepreneurs who say, you know, I've been in the business of building roads for 10 years, look at my customer review rating services, five stars out of five stars, or someone said, you know, pick me, you know, three years uh, guarantee, or three years uh, off, you know, of our services or whatnot. Different ways to compete, but when government outsources this, you don't have that freedom to choose, and which is why it's like driving around the moon around here in Richmond at times, right? Um, so government doesn't really build anything. They don't really create anything. They first have to steal your wealth, your productivity to taxes um, and to other areas and to kind of fund these uh, unfunded liabilities of their monopolies. So that's what government is. In terms of anarchy, um, remember, there exists no factual evidence that you can show me of a contractual relationship with government. It doesn't exist. The social contract is not real, right? Can anyone show me the social contract? It right? doesn't exist. It's not a real tangible paper, but you can show me your mortgage contract. I don't know if you guys have mortgage contracts, but you can show me your uh, AT&T contract, your um, Netflix contract, your car payment contracts, real contracts, or when you have an apartment, you have contracts there too, right? Real explicit consent, right? Your signature in which you agree to the rules and to the consequences, right? No dogs allowed here, cats are allowed there. Uh, if you bring an extra pet, here's an extra penalty fine you'd have to pay, right? But I give explicit consent to the consequences to those rules. But in regards to government, there exists no factual evidence of such contract. Um, 
So many people may think of the Constitution as a contract, but of course, you never gave power of attorney to them, right? If you were never alive back then. The 37 or 39 signers who signed that contract keep that contract to themselves, right? If I got with a group of my friends and signed a contract into ourselves, that would not be applicable to any of you since you guys are not part of party to that contract, right? Um, so we kind of have to look at these things more honestly, objectively, and how they are. Um, and in that regards, remember, we're not advocating against rules, because I want rules, right? I think rules are important. It's rules in games, rules in uh, uh, social norms. Like, if you go into a house, you may have, like, no shoes allowed, you know? Uh, close the toilet seat down when you use the washroom or something. But we have rules that we all kind of consensual agree to. And we can have rules. You just don't need a monopoly on rules. And that's what government has. They have a monopoly on law. They don't, they don't allow competing uh, polycentric legal systems to resolve your disputes. Um, like, for example, if you're paying for that judge to resolve your dispute, it should be the judge that stands up in the courtroom when you enter there, right? You're the consumer. You're their customer, right? Uh, it shouldn't be in which he can hold you in contempt of court because he doesn't like what you wear. He doesn't like what you're saying. Uh, if you went to Wendy's and they treated you that in such a manner, <laughs> you go out there and you, know, you go on, um, on the internet, you, you blog about it. Nobody, they go bankrupt if they treated their customer in such a manner, right? Uh, so that's exactly what government is. The opposite would be a contractual society, a free and voluntary society. Uh, so what Virginia is objectively, they have a monopoly on all these rules, and Virginia itself is a monopolized community. In the absence of a monopolized community, you have thousands, then, of communities that cater to your lifestyle and preference. You can have your cannabis-friendly community, one across the street that's not, right? And as so much a good real-life example of this would be like uh, the Amish. The Amish know that babies cannot give consent uh, to the rules. So they wait until the child is 18, and here's the rules to the community. And if you give consent to it, the only consequences you have in breaking these rules is just social ostracism. That's it. There's no fine, no penalty. So it could be whatever uh, consequences you agree to. Some of these things already exist today, like golf course communities, right? Homeowner associations pays for the roads, pays for security. You have uh, Disney World has security, and they have roads. You have your mall, they have security. They have free Wi-Fi. <laughs> they have uh, the roads as well as there. Uh, you have your like senior homes in Florida, you know, 55 and older communities. So if you think of it that way, you have then thousands of competing communities, again, catering to your lifestyle preferences with rules and contexts that you can give explicit agreement to, right? And so the opposite of what government is, which is non-contractual, non-consensual, coheres it from the top down, uh, anarchy is uh, consensual, contractual, voluntary, right? So even you break down the word anarchy, entomology-wise, like in science, anions and cations, and means without. Archie means rulers, so without rulers. In this context, without political rulers, uh, which means politicians, without strangers you've never met, arbitrarily deciding how best your life should be run, right? How best I should spend uh, nearly half your income in terms of taxes, right? Uh, they can decide what you can and cannot do with your own body, but you can't tell the politicians the same thing, right? So anarchy just means without those who seek to initiate force onto other people. Right? Not just uh, the government itself, but those against each other, and especially that done to children. Right? You want to universalize these principles as you would any law of physics. Right? The uh, gravity exists at all places at all time. These are things we want to universalize as well. It's not just wrong to initiate force against you, but on any other individual person that you, you come to meet, right? regardless of their title, regardless of the color costume they wear, right? blue or green. Uh, and that's called a non-aggression principle, right? universalizing that. And in that regard, uh, that's what, what anarchy is. It's, it's the complete opposite of that. It's nothing to do with um, overthrowing government. There's no Molotov cocktails. There's no uh, violence. There's no smashing windows. It's actually a big respect for private properties. The essence of anarchy really is consent, right? I want consensual relationships. I want uh, the ability to, to disassociate if I choose to, right, from those who want to, uh, I guess, instill or force their views upon me, right? Uh, so that's pretty much a basic breakdown and summary of anarcho-capitalism. Uh, the capitalism part is this respect for private property or voluntary exchange. Uh, and anarchy just means without those who seek to initiate force. You know? uh, and that's, that's it. And so we could go off into questions, if you guys have, in terms of uh, like how would such and such would be provided or, uh, or anything of the like, if you guys have. Yes? So you're talking about monopolizing by the government. Yeah. So, in anarchy, would that mean anarchy 
Who's the staff? Uh, you are. So, like, for example, since anyone can compete now, uh, maybe there's not a community that you like. You like, so you start a Kickstarter campaign. You have a business plan. Uh, you say, you know, here's the, uh, the rules to this community. So you have a lot of different competing communities with different rules. So you can have one in which the consequences of aggressing against someone could be restitution directly to the victim. It could be a penalty fund. It could be uh, a thunderdome. Two may enter, one may leave. Or it could be a pillow fight, right? To the actual consequences to the rules you give consent to, right? The rules here that the government imposes upon you, you don't have consent to that. You don't have a contract with that, right? So there could be a wide variety of rich, diverse ways to kind of resolve these uh, conflicts of dispute, uh, in which in a matter that is still consensual. Uh, now, one interesting area of that would be like, what happens if you don't want to uh, abide by the contract, right? Since it's all voluntary, it's all consensual. That's perfectly fine too. Say like. I, uh, I live in a community that has uh, cannabis is not allowed, but I smoke cannabis. And I agreed already that that was not permissible. And uh, the agreement was I pay a $400 fine. And I said, you know, F that. Uh, I'm not going to uh, oblige that contract. I'm not going to, uh, I guess, keep my word. I mean, that's perfectly fine. That just says that I don't keep my word. I don't keep my contract. That information is provided to other people out there. And they themselves would take that risk. You know, so I see that you keep breaking your contracts all the time. I see that you keep breaking your word. I don't know if I really want to associate myself uh, or take that risk of providing you such a service because you might defraud me as well. Right? And that's the same way you can uh, see this on eBay. Right? People have one-star ratings. The product doesn't come there on time. It comes broken. It comes missing. Uh, and you, you check, uh, this is a good product, but I see all the customer reviews. It's like, mm, I don't think I want to associate myself or take that risk. So you can have... Uh, different ways of social ostracism that are voluntary and consensual to kind of enforce these rules without doing what the government does, initiating force, right? Um, so are there any societies that have been successfully done this throughout history? Uh, we kind of do it now, like in this room. Our, our own interpersonal relationships are voluntary and consensual, right? <laughs> uh, and that's what anarchy is. Anarchy is consensual relationship. The freedom to associate or disassociate, right? I don't hurt my friends. I don't steal for them. I don't assault them. I don't initiate force. Uh, and neither do they. Not because there's a piece of paper that someone read in some strangers in the, in the Capitol building, but because of, I find it to be immoral to do so, right? I value my friendships. I care about them, right? So here in this room, we have a state of anarchy. No one here is initiating force, right? Um, so in a, in a micro level, right, when you look at a society, only individual people exist, right? You can't show me your friends, your family, you can't show me America without showing me individual people. You can't show me your family without showing me individual people, right? And then those individual interpersonal relationships, anarchy exists, right? It's voluntary and it's consensual. Um, that, does that help answer the question? Yeah. So, but in, in, in the direction that I want to go, and many people want to go, I guess, in that direction, I do want to have that freedom. I do want to go to a free society based on consent, right? That doesn't exist here today. Um, so the best way to start that is actually within our own interpersonal relationships to have these discussions, right? Um, it's not going to be by advocating uh, an organization funded on violence to overturn itself, right? It's like trying to uh, sneak into the KKK that's founded on racism and try to attempt it to turn it against racism, right? Or trying to sneak into the mafia and turn them against extortion, right? Um, it's it's got to be, it's going to have to be something that, uh, something that we already do in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, to kind of live consistently with that, uh, not uh, ask the first three questions that we were talking about earlier in describing what is government, that government is an organization that initiates for us, this has to be something that you turn away from that altogether, from politics, from voting, uh, and turn to our, this society, this group that already has these uh, foundational values for respect for one another, for that equality, for the non-initiation, of course, uh, and go in the other direction. Uh, for example, because there exists no factual evidence in history that voting has ever set anyone free. The politics has ever set anyone free. You know, the fact that we were all were born as tax slaves today negates uh, those campaigns, negates those uh, struggles, negates uh, people trying to use the power of government to free us, right? Um, you said that this was anarcho-capitalism, and can't capitalism as an economic form um, exert that economic force that uh, anarchy assaults politically? So you have this force that makes people do things against their consent. Can't capitalism cause that same problem economically instead of politically? Uh, 
All right, so okay, so that's interesting because that kind of goes into like corporations, for example, right? Is that kind of where you're yeah. leading with that? Okay, um, the cool thing about corporations is that they cease to exist when government ceases to exist. All a corporation is is a piece of paper backed and enforced by government that allows CEOs to escape liability for their own actions. The same immunity that many congressmen enjoy, that state prosecutors enjoy, that judges enjoy. You can't sue a judge. <laughs> you can't sue a state prosecutor, right? They have immunity from their actions. That same immunity is granted to CEOs like... Um, the CEOs who are responsible for the uh, Valdez oil uh, spill off the coast of Alaska, they didn't lose their jobs, lose their money, lose their house, they didn't go to jail, nothing happened to them. They're able to offset the cost into the employees by lowering their salaries to the consumers by raising consumer prices. But without government, corporations cease to exist, right? Uh, there was a guy I remember hearing that he was going, driving an HOV lane and he got pulled over, <coughs> like, where's your, where's your passenger? So it's right here, here's my corporation papers, right? Apparently the government has ruled that corporations are people. Uh, <laughs> so in, in that regards, um, you can have, the moment that someone wants to aggress against their employees or against their uh, customers, they go bankrupt the next day. You can think about like Netflix trying to raise their prices overnight two years ago. Do you remember, do you remember that? Overnight, very sneaky like. And uh, people were like, cancel and subscribe, go to Hulu, right? You have the freedom to, to choose, to direct. You're the one in charge in that regard. Um, you mentioned, for example, like different communities within like a certain area and each one would have different rules and when you enter you sign like a contract or whatever it would be yeah. saying I can't break these rules and here's the consequences if I do. Let's say you enter a community and um, you break the rules and to use a very extreme example you kill somebody right. and then you leave the community whose job is it to enforce punishment for what you did just as violating another human's basic rights so you, you, you assaulted that. All right, that's a great question. So say uh, you had community A, community B. Yeah. Each has their own security services. Each has their own uh, private dispute uh, organization, right? A uh, person who helps resolve these conflicts of disputes. So person B going to person A's community, of course, you need a guest pass, like when you go, right? So actually, so you have someone else who's responsible for your actions, right? Who will also be kind of penalized for that. Um, at the same time, the only person who has really much of a say of all this is the victim, right? It's the victim who can decide whether or not that was initiation of force or whether they want to pursue charges or just let it go. Um, at the same time, when you have competing uh, conflicts of dispute organizations, uh, they want to have the same similar rules for respect for private property, right? Uh, it's it's uh, cheaper, it's, uh, it's more efficient. Like you have a lot of uh, AT&T and uh, Sprint uh, and Verizon kind of use a lot of the same towers for one another, especially if they don't have coverage in that area. So they, they, they collaborate with one another. A lot of businesses do a lot of collaborations with one another, and you'll find in these communities that they'll do the same thing because they don't want to have that kind of problem themselves. Like in the event that my client goes into your community and causes aggression, let's agree to these fundamental rules. And not so much like you have like car insurance payments, right? Uh, you have your you have your um, Geico versus Allstate, right? These are pretty much the same thing, uh, and they have similar rules. Like if your person initiated force, we'll pay out, right? Uh, so. That's the sense of what would happen. That person will kind of be penalized by the rules that he gave consent to uh, his own security service or his own dispute resolution organization. So what would happen if, like, leader from Group B goes and kills somebody in Group A, and Group B doesn't want to enforce Group A's rules? Uh, I guess, first of all, it's like, I hire a new security. How did you uh, manage to uh, get into my, uh, what you, uh, like, uh, you have to remember there's security there as well, right? Yeah. Like, Disney World has security. Shopping malls have security. So, you know, <coughs> I would say, like, uh, First of all, like they failed in their mission, you know, so you have other entrepreneurs to provide better security. Um, so say that somebody came in there and killed someone, and went back to their community so they didn't get caught. Yeah. Um, that seems high. Well, I would imagine if, if that, was, that were the case and he came back here, this company will contact that company. Here's the evidence that we have that uh, someone there uh, murdered person B in this community uh, would like to resolve this dispute. Uh, this company will also want to resolve the dispute because in the event that the opposite happens, they also want to have a, a peaceful um, way to resolve it because violence is very costly, right? The insurance rate for that is very high to go into escalations of war. Uh, the only way you can have war today is through taxes. Since there's no taxes, uh, you can't fund and sustain like huge armies in that regards, right? So as a business, you want to find the most efficient way to resolve these disputes. So you're going to have these shared common rules with one another with other companies in the events of uh, like, again, like if I hit your car, Right, uh, your uh, auto insurance may try to deny it, but they realize that if someone were to hit their client's car, uh, you don't want to go in this area in which um, 
there's a lot of dispute and nobody's trying to, I guess, claim their insurance money, right? Trying to, um, how, what's a better way to say it? I, I would imagine that's the best way, like Geico and Allstate. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, know, they know who initiates that force and they don't have, well, we're not going to pay, right? That's our client because they want the same uh, protection in the event that you hit my car, right? Okay. Uh, you can look at it as a, um, what's the best way uh, to describe it? <coughs> All right, so, so all right, great way to resolve it. So say that you don't want to resolve this uh, conflict dispute. Perfectly fine. In the event that you have a dispute of conflict with other people, they're going to say, first, you've got to resolve that conflict first, right? Because uh, we don't want to provide these services. It says here on the record that you have a dispute with someone. You need to resolve that first before you uh, ask for services to resolve your own conflict of disputes, right? So there would be, like, different ways to kind of socially ostracize different kind of checks and balances in that regards. Um, and at the same time, that's kind of like economic suicide, right? Uh, because nobody has to provide you service at that point. Because, uh, for example, if you murder someone and you're not going to pay reparations, the communities surrounding you are going to say, well, I don't think I feel comfortable providing services to, to a murderer, I guess, in that regard, right? It hasn't resolved that dispute. You know, since all, all uh, connections are voluntary and consensual, uh, you don't have to have water, electricity, the internet, right? AT&T will pay you $150 to, you know, to cancel their service contract. So I just have, like, a question about, like, your community thing, and it might sound, like, extreme, but what stops, like, one community from creating, like, their own sort of faction, like, private military and stuff like that, and, like, that, that community, like, Community A taking over Community B and then forcing Community B to do to abide by community A's right. uh, All right, that's a really good question. Okay, so um, when, you have, when you have thousands of competing uh, services uh, protection, they can have contracts with one another, especially smaller ones. In the event I'm attacked by a bigger one, I'm pretty sure you would want the same assurance. Uh, let's ally together and take that down, right? You have this uh, shown historically in Europe. Whenever a large one comes in there, all the smaller ones ally together to break it down and go back to the national boundaries, right? But at the same time, if that community is trying to start, uh, trying to go warlord mode, um, there's a lot of services that go into that, right? I don't think I would want to be in the business and be known that I'm uh, providing water or internet or uh, food to such a warlord organization, right? Lest my competitors show the other consumers, hey, look at this guy, he's supporting this warlord uh, organization, uh, go with us instead, right? It's like... Uh, marketing suicide in that regards. So you'll find it will be quickly unsustainable for them to kind of continue to keep up with that, right? Uh, and at the same time, if it was your security company trying to go warlord mode, uh, your CEO, that's kind of, again, that's economic suicide in regards. Like, why would the CEO who has a great increase of profit want to eliminate that already? I don't, it'd be difficult to imagine the shareholders allowing that to happen, right? It'd be difficult to, uh, to see how fast that could happen when at a click of the button you can cancel and subscribe, you know, your service, since it's all voluntary and consensual, right? Um, so the moment they try to go warlord mode, I'd imagine just like Netflix try to increase their prices overnight, they nearly went bankrupt, right? Their stock plummeted, right? Um, they don't have uh, taxation anymore, that forced taxation to kind of fund these armies. You know, it's the same reason why Hitler wanted to take over France so quickly was to take over the tax farm in France to fund his war machine. Without taxes, you don't really have that economic sustainability to fund such a huge costly uh, army to, to invade other countries or communities. But at the same time, again, you have a lot of, you'll have a coalition <laughs> of all the thousands of free societies and communities that will band together and uh, defend each other. Oh, that's great. Um, I would say that education is innate, right? The desire to learn is innate. It's not something that's given to anyone. Information is given to each other, sure. Uh, but, you know, you have... Uh, so that's something I guess we have to kind of really understand. The desire to learn, the desire to, to grow, to read, uh, to learn is innate. Uh, so what we can uh, devise... Because what schools are, they're also a monopoly. It's a monopoly in education, right? And that's so much like if you went to a school at uh, Walgreens or something like that, right? What you'll learn is Walgreens ethics, Walgreens virtues. On the walls, you'll have all the CEOs of Walgreens, right? Uh, you'll never hear about competing uh, services from that. You know, like for example, we talked about USPS earlier. Um, has anyone ever heard of Lysander Spooner? This gentleman has. Uh, so Lysander Spooner is someone that didn't really talk much in uh, public history textbooks. Uh, Lysander Spooner was a guy 100 years ago 
he saw in the Constitution that they didn't have the exclusive right to have a post office. And so he found a loophole. So he competed. He created the American Letter Mail Company. And the price of stamps back then to deliver mail was $3.50. And so through his competition, he did it faster, cheaper, efficient. He started spreading from D.C. to Philadelphia to New York. Uh, but of course, that's the last thing that government wants in that regard. So they sued him out of uh, in court after a lot of legal debt. And the next year, Congress just passed a law that says, okay, we're not dealing with that anymore. We're just going to pass a law that says no one is allowed to compete with USPS. So I would say in terms of education, um, and in regards to like how universities today are heavily subsidized, um, you wouldn't have, I guess, the high rising cost to get like that information like on the computer or on the internet as it exists today, right? Um, subsidizing anything really kind of outcompetes the other private industries or private interests that are doing a good job already, right? Um, that's uh, unfair competition that shouldn't be there to begin with, right? Uh, and it's so much that they subsidize agriculture businesses. Um, like, it, 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 since we're all here in Virginia, anyone been to like Polyface Farms? Uh, Joe Salatin? Anyone heard of that? Like, for example, one of the reasons why meat costs so low is they're heavily subsidized. Meat should actually be like eight times the cost of uh, how much it is today. Why organic food costs so much is because of all the restrictions and all the regulations on it. It should be very cheap, but since uh, their government involvement in that market and subsidizing uh, like the meat industry, you don't really have, I guess, good, affordable, cheap food that you would have if uh, government didn't subsidize their competitors. You mentioned having separate communities with different like, morals and contracts that they have to abide by. What would like, prevent that from creating a lack of diversity and just ultimate segregation between different Oh, let I me mean, they're definitely communicating. I mean, it's so much that this kind of stuff kind of exists a little bit today. I mean, you have Nickelodeon, you have uh, different areas here of Richmond, different communities, like uh, you have the art district in Richmond, right? Different kind of communities like that. And uh, the different places that we would meet were like our malls, right? When you go to a mall, I don't know what religion, what preferences you have, what orientation you are. I don't really, I don't know any of that, right? It's, there's nothing like a sensei is hanging over your head, you know, denoting uh, where you're from or what your preferences are. The only thing I care about are like the free samples they give around the food courts or the competing t-shirt businesses that are around there. I mean, there will be a lot of economic activity to kind of, to co-mingle and stuff like that. But pretty much what I find is that uh, a lot of people just don't want to see certain preferences that they don't agree with in their own home, right? Some people may abhor cannabis, and that's perfectly fine. They just don't want it in their own home. I will live in the apartment across the street, for example, that's perfectly okay, right? That's 420 friendly, right? So you can have the freedom to associate and disassociate, uh, and that creates that versus diverse different ways of like it's marketing preferences. You know, there's no need then to uh, have this uh, government system with the majority preferences forced into the minority, right? The 51 percent onto the 49 percent, right? Mob rule, for example. So without that, you then have thousands of rich and diverse communities uh, that we can experiment with. That, that there's no longer this need or fear to guess, hide uh, what it is that you like. Uh, you know, hide your uh, your preferences, your opinions, uh, your thoughts. Um, there's no there's no rule there that you give consent to that would I guess uh, I can't imagine one to uh, be a part of that community. If I like cannabis, I'm not going to move into the one that doesn't like it, right? Um, but at the same time, there yeah, there'll be a lot of ways to commingle. I'll, I'll probably have a timeshare, and uh, anyone ever play Follow Three? Yeah, I'll probably have a timeshare in the Follow Three community. You know, so you have thousands of rich different communities. I have friends who are really into that. Maybe uh, they'll create that kind of a replica, right? So you just have, uh, and that'd be a great way to experiment and uh, how to create these kind of fun, rich ways to kind of live and uh, share and explore with. Business resources, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you just have a, it'll be back in the way how it used to be, where businesses saved a lot of money in the event that they made a mistake, uh, they would uh, they they could cover their risks, right? Uh, whereas if you have a corporation, you just like you're wearing an Iron Man suit, walking in the middle of the street, knowing you can't get hit, right? You have immunity from uh, all your actions. Uh, so without that uh, immunity, you you still have businesses, but it'll be a, a way which you have a lot more 
freedom to invest, freedom to grow. You don't have market restrictions on uh, like licenses and premises that discriminate against, against the poor from competing, for example. Uh, so I guess that was, that was the bell for everyone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, being